It is entitled, The Cry of the Heathen. The text is found in Acts chapter 16 and verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. This was no doubt a special vision sent of God for the direction of the apostle, for we are told in the next verse that they assuredly gathered from this vision that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel in Macedonia. And yet the vision may be very readily accounted for by natural causes. Men usually dream of that which is most upon their minds. Who would marvel that the miser should, in his restless sleep, be pictured to his own sight as counting over his gold? Who wonders that the mother's dream is often concerning her fair infant? Who marvels that the wife frequently dreams of shipwrecks, when in the stormy night she lies upon her bed, her last thoughts having been exercised concerning her husband at sea? You wonder not that the soldier in the trenches dreams of battle, and hence we cannot marvel that the Apostle Paul, whose whole soul was full of his master's cause, should have a vision in the night concerning a new field of labor, which God had intended to open up to him. You will remember that the Apostle was, on this occasion, in a peculiar condition. He at first endeavored to preach the gospel in Phrygia and Galatia, but he was forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. The apostle was like Abraham of old. He went forth, not knowing whither he went. There was a certain path which he must take, and when he strove to turn either to the right hand or to the left, the Spirit directly forbade him, and he was compelled to go on till he came to the seaport of Troas. There, wearied with his journey, he cast himself upon his couch, and in the midst of the night a vision appeared unto him. A man who by his brogue and his dress was discovered to be a Macedonian said to him, Come over and help us. God sometimes tells men in their sleep the secret they could not discover when they were awake. We have heard of the preacher who, tired late on Saturday evening, has been unable to think of a discourse, in the middle of the night has dreamed it through, and on the morrow has ascended his pulpit and preached it. What wonder, then, that the Apostle Paul, specially directed by the Spirit of God, after all day long wearily exercising his mind as to the journey God intended him to take, should, after all, when in his sleep, have a vision from on high, teaching him where he should go. And now, beloved, having thus prefaced our discourse, we have another observation to make before we proceed to a full discussion of the text. What an instance of divine sovereignty we have in our text! He who is wise can see sovereignty everywhere in the work of salvation, but how clearly is it present here! Bithynia must not hear the gospel. The apostle desires to go and preach it there, but as yet it seems, God does not intend that Bithynia should be evangelized. He desires to tarry in Asia, and there, throughout its length and breadth, preach the gospel. But he is strictly forbidden and the command comes to him that he is to go across to Europe, and there proclaim the gospel. Was not this sovereignty? Why was it that God shut the door in Bithynia and opened it in Philippi? Was it that Philippi was more worthy, or that Bithynia needed it less? Assuredly not. It was of God's mercy that he sent the gospel at any time. And when he sent to Philippi the most eminent of apostles to preach it, who shall blame him? Has he not a right to do what he wills with his own? But we may rest quite assured that his sovereignty was not an arbitrary exercise of despotic will. It was a sovereignty dictated by the highest wisdom. For while God rules all things according to his own will, yet we are expressly told that he doeth it according to the counsels of his will, his will being no blind headstrong thing, willing for no reason whatever, but always subject to his own sense of that which is wisest, and which will promote his glory and his creature's profit. However, we must still observe, divine sovereignty is that which casts a rich luster upon grace, when we recollect that it is sovereign and free. O ye of the race of Britain, bless the Lord that he hath sent the gospel unto you. For while doubtless there is wisdom in it, remember there is also sovereignty in it, he hath not dealt so with any nation. Praise ye the Lord. Had he willed it, 
Had he seen fit, the gospel had this day been flourishing in the center of Africa, and you might at this moment have been destitute of the word of the gospel, living barbarians like your fathers, embrewing your hands in blood. Unto the great dread sovereign who ruleth as he wills on earth as in heaven, be glory for ever and ever. And now we turn to our text. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. First we shall observe that the best help that can be rendered to any people is the preaching of the gospel. Come over and help us, that is, preach to us. Secondly, we shall notice that although we have no visions or dreams in the night, yet the nations of the earth are calling to the church of the living God and are saying to us, Come over to us and help us. And then, thirdly, I shall conclude by solemnly asking the question, What do you who love the Lord intend to say to those who are now asking at your hands the help of a preached gospel? First, then, the greatest help that can be given to any people is the preaching of the gospel. And when I say this, I am uttering a truth which I need not guard. The gospel is a help, but not in one way, but in every way. Those who have not the gospel stand in the greatest need of help. But when the gospel is carried, you carry everything within it. In the folds of the gospel sleepeth the manifold wisdom of God, and his manifold goodness also towards the sons of men. Behold, the nations of the earth this day are still the bond-slaves of tyrants. Many lands are still subject to despotic dynasties, who trample men beneath their feet, as if men were but earthen pitchers to be broken in pieces by the iron rods of kings. How is liberty to be established in these lands? Shall the point of the bayonet bring liberty to these nations that are still slaves? Never, never. Iron makes our fetters, iron rivets them, but iron can never unloose them. We need something more potent than steel to carve out the liberty of mankind. Love, the love of the gospel, must be the groundwork of liberty. And if liberty, equality, and fraternity, the three great words that are the world's heirloom, are ever to be fully known and realized, it must be by the preaching of the word of Jesus. The preaching of the gospel is the terror of despots. If you ask what makes this land free, every candid man must say, it is the open gospel and the unfettered preaching of the word. Glasgow's motto is, let Glasgow flourish by the preaching of the word. It is the coat of arms of liberty itself. Liberty flourishes by the preaching of the word of God. Certain it is that wherever you find Protestantism, you find liberty. And wherever you leave Protestantism behind, you begin to feel the yoke and hear the groans of the oppressed. It is true that Protestantism doth not in every place produce perfect liberty, because it is not sufficiently true to itself. There are still places where the slave feels the lash, while his master calls himself a Christian. But this is not the legitimate effect of our religion, but rather the effect of a delusion which hell itself did first invent and which naught but the deep depravity of man could ever permit to stand before the face of God's Son. Yes, ye tyrants on your thrones, the little stone cut out of the mountain without hands shall yet break you in pieces. O great statue of tyranny, with thy head of gold and thy feet of clay, thou shalt yet totter, for this shall break thee in pieces, for the breaker is come out before us, and the king at the head of us, and who can withstand his might? What shall hold out against the mighty principle wherewith Christ makes men free? Look, brethren, too, and see how the nations of the earth are lying under gloomy superstition. Perhaps there is one thing in the world worse than kingcraft, and that is priestcraft. May God save us from two things, from tyrannical kings and from priests of all sorts. Priests of any sort are bad, but superstitious priests are the worst of all. Oh, how many nations of the earth have their intellect blighted, their hopes blasted, their progress stopped, their whole history eclipsed of its glory, their state robbed of its riches by the cursed dominancy of priests. Men are compelled to believe just what the priest chooses. 
because he wears a cassock, because he has been educated in the deep mysteries of craftiness, he is to be lord over men's consciences, and consciences and hearts are to bow before him. Wherever he comes, his word is to be law, his will is to open and shut the gates of heaven, for he pretends that the keys of heaven and of Hades are hanging at his girdle. How shall we deliver men from these enthralling superstitions? No how, but by the preaching of the gospel. You cannot make men free even by governments. You cannot give them a thorough freedom by giving them a republic itself. For that republic must fall so long as priestcraft is there. For liberty and priestcraft agree as well together as God and devil, and no better. And until one falls, the other can never stand. But the preaching of the gospel, which teaches that believers are all priests and kings, which lifts every one of us into the high places of princes and monarchs, and puts every one of us on a level with pontiffs and priests, this is the gospel which shall yet set men free. And the preaching of this, and this only, is the world's great and grandest hope of its deliverance from the slavery of the body and the yet more accursed bondage of the soul. But, beloved, there are some nations on the earth that have never as yet tasted of the sweets of salvation. Large tracts of country have been discovered, where the people are still debased and degraded. The kraal of the Hottentot has not yet blossomed into a mansion. The spear of the New Zealander has not yet been entirely changed for a pruning hook. There are many places where all the joys of life and the social comforts and enjoyments of our being are as yet totally unknown. Now the gospel has blessings in both its hands. Wherever it goes, it has the promise of heaven rich and golden. It has the blessing of the earth fair and silvery. They are both precious things. And while we believe the gospel is ordained most of all to bless men for the hereafter, yet the secularist himself, if he were wise, must take some interest in the progress of the gospel, for it is a blessing to men even in this life. The great civilizer is the cross. Nothing else can make the barbarian into a civilized man but the cross and the vision of Christ hanging on it. Blessed are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of peace, for where they bring the glad tidings of peace with God, they bring also good news of good will towards men, even good will towards men as creatures here, as well as good news to them as creatures that are to exist forever. My dear brethren and sisters, if you would bless the world in the largest possible sense, temporarily, spiritually, and eternally, if you would bless the bodies and the souls of men, if you would bless men and their children in their houses, if you would bless them in their meats and drinks and in all the necessities of life, the one simple means of doing all this is just the proclamation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that fully preached and received has been proved in instances which I need not now stop to recall to your memories, instances abundant and recent, to be, after all, the power of God, not only to salvation, but to civilization too. There is yet one more point which I must mention here, in which the gospel is the best help to man. We must remember today that there are districts of the earth where the ground is yet red with blood, there are sad portions of our globe that as yet must have the name of Aseldama, the field of gore. There are spots where the horse-hoof is splashed with blood, where the very carcasses of men are the food of ravens and of jackals. The mounds of Balaclava are as yet scarcely green, and the spots where rest the relics of our own murdered sisters and brothers are not covered with the memorial stone." War has ravaged whole districts. Even in these late times the dogs of war are not yet muzzled. Oh, what shall we do to put an end to war? Mars, where is the chain that shall bind thee, like Prometheus, to the rock? How shall we imprison thee forever, thou cruel Moloch? How shall we forever chain thee? Behold, here is the great chain, that which one day is to bind the great serpent, it has the blood-red links of love. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the crucified one, shall yet hush the clarion of war and break the battle bow in sunder. Happy are we, thrice happy, 
that we have a gospel which shall make men hang the useless helmet high and study war no more. Let us spread it, then, to the earth's utmost bounds, for, to repeat the text I quoted just now, it hath blessings in both its hands. Wherever it goes, temporarily as well as eternally, it blesses the human race. And when it shall have spread to its utmost limits, when all the habitable earth shall be covered with it, then the mist that swathes our planet shall be rolled away, and bright like a newborn morning star, this earth shall shine out with her sister stars in all her glory. The angels shall once more sing, and God himself shall repeat his verdict, All things are very good. But still, beloved, the greatest help that the gospel brings is help to the soul. Ah, Christian men, ye know what this means. Your brothers and sisters are this day wandering blindfold, they know not whither. Ye know, for the Bible tells you, that they are wending their weary way down to the black gulf of despair. Oh, does not your heart desire that the blind eye should be opened, that the misguided should be directed on the path of heaven? Would not your pity desire to snatch the firebrand from the flame? Do you not anxiously seek to know how you can lead the vicious to virtue and the virtuous to the righteousness that is in Jesus Christ? Have you no desire to see God's elect ingathered, to see them washed and sanctified and perfected? Remember, this is to be, and since it is to be, it is certain that ye must send the gospel far and wide, for by no other means can God's elect be gathered home. How can they believe without a preacher? How can they preach except they be sent? The gospel must go throughout all lands, that the elect may be gathered home, and the Messiah's kingdom come. O oh, ye who love the souls of men, it is to you an awful thought that hell's caverns are filling. It is a dreary thing to you to see the broad road so crowded with its many travelers. You are longing and wishing that the narrow way might have more pilgrims. I beseech you then, look to it, that by every means and by all means ye aid the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. For it is the help for which the earth calls, and the help which you must render to it. Come over and help us by preaching Christ's holy gospel. Thus have I done with the first head, and may the Lord help us in the second. The second point is, that although not in visions of the night, yet every day and every hour, the nations of the earth are saying, Come over and help us. Do you not know that the loudest eloquence is silence? To move the heart of the right-minded, ye need not the declamation of the orator. The sight of silent dumb misery is the highest eloquence to a tender heart. It is true, I must confess it, the nations of the earth do not vocally ask for your help. Nay, worse than that, if you send them the help of the gospel, they will, many of them, reject it. Your missionaries have been slain. The altars of false gods have been stained with their blood. But still, I solemnly repeat it, the nations of the earth are silently crying, Come over and help us. If I saw a person in the street, sick, faint, and dying, although he spoke not to me, though he asked me not to befriend him, I should think the weakness of his silence more potent than all the power of words. Ay, and if I saw him like a maniac rejecting my help and pushing me from him, if I was convinced that he was really a maniac, for that very reason that he needed my help, I would thrust my alms upon him, I would willingly give him my help and assistance. And so must you do. The nations of the earth are dead in sin. How can they cry to you? But it is yours to see their misery." and let the poor, poor dumb wounds of this bleeding earth speak to you. It is true, earth is a maniac, and it puts away the only cure. But what care we for that? It is ours to thrust our kindness upon unwilling men, because we believe that their unwillingness arises from the madness of their disease. Let us take the poor man that has fallen among the thieves. Let us pour in the oil and the wine, 
And if he doth not receive it gratefully, because he is faint, if he putteth his hand upon the wound, and rends away the liniment, and unbinds the plaster, nevertheless let us bind him up again, and set him upon our own beast, and carry him to the inn. Let us pay for the lodging, even though as yet he cannot speak to thank us. And the day shall come when the wound is healed, and the burning fever is removed, when his brain is cool and his reason restored, that he shall fall at our feet, and kiss the hand that once he spurned. Unborn generations shall bless the men that sent the gospel, which at first their fathers did reject. And now, brothers and sisters, let me plead the cause of the dumb. No man of Macedonia is here today to say, Come over and help us, but let me be the heathen spokesman, and very earnestly ask you to come and help him. Methinks I will stand here as a heathen this morning, and I say to you, as if I had not heard the gospel, Ye Christians of Britain, ye highly favored ones, who know the name of Jesus and prove the power of the Spirit, preach the gospel to us, for we are men like yourselves. What though our skin be of a color less fair than your own? Yet he fashioneth our hearts alike." Oh, tell us not, because we feed on the locust and eat the serpent, that therefore we are not of your kith and kind. Not that which goeth into a man defileth a man. It is true our kings and princes are only fit to rank with your beggars. But, oh, God hath made of one blood all nations that dwell upon the face of the earth. And from our huts and cabins we come forth today, and we say to you, We are men, we are your brothers, younger brothers, it is true. We have not had a double portion of the inheritance. Brothers, too, whose fathers spent their part in riotous living. But why should the children's teeth be set on edge because the fathers have eaten sour grapes? Why must the son of Ham forever bear the curse of Canaan? Oh, preach the gospel to us. We are men. Mother Eve is our mother as well as yours. Adam, too, is the father from whose loins we sprang. And because we are men, the common sympathy of humanity bids you listen to us when we say, Come over and help us. Besides, we have another argument. We are told that unto you is the word of this salvation sent, not for yourselves, but for us, brothers who have not heard the gospel and who know it not. And you have the treasure in your own hand. And we believe you have the treasure given to you, that you may lavish handfuls of it out to us. We know that old Judea had the covenant and the oracles, and the gospel to keep for coming generations. And we believe that you men of Britain have the gospel, not for yourselves, but for us. We have heard that your master said, Ye are the lights of the world, not lights of Britain, not lights for yourselves, but lights of the world. O oh, bear your burning torches into the glades of our dark forests. Come and shed your light through the dark mists of our idolatrous temples. Let the bats of our superstition and the owls of our ignorance fly away before the sunlight of your gospel. It is not for yourselves you have received it, but for us. O oh, give it to us. Preach the gospel to us, for it is designed for us. But we have another argument, brethren. Look at our miseries. As the spokesman for my poor brethren today, I stand before you and I remind you of the tortures to which the poor Hindu devotee puts himself. I remind you of the cruelties enacted in the Chinese empire, the horrors of a government that is based upon idolatry. I tell you of the distress, the destitution, the poverty, the nakedness, the misery of the Betuanas and the Bushmen. And I speak for these, and I say, Christians, you have the means of alleviating their woes by sending them the gospel. Will you not do it? Look at the dwellers in the land of the jungle and the lion. There they are. The serpent has grasped them in his folds, and like the boa constrictor of their own forests, he is crushing their nations, until the ribs of the strong man snap, and the hearts of the women melt like wax. And you have the sword in your hands that can cut the serpent's head. Your master bruised that head beneath his heel, and you must do the same. O oh, come, come, ye missionaries of the cross, ye ministers of Jesus, 
Come and deliver us from this deadly hydra. Save us from our fearful doom. Our miseries invoke your aid. It is true we cannot speak to you in gentle language. But there was a time when poets walked among us, and some of the light that shone in paradise yet gilded our darkness. And we treasured up a few of those faint rays, and we are hoping that the sun of righteousness will yet dawn upon us. Oh, come roll away these mists. Come chase our night and let us see that sacred, high, eternal noon, which is the daughter of the gospel, following the Son of Righteousness. And now, Christian men, let me speak to you as one of yourselves. Brethren, you and I are soldiers of the cross, and at this hour worlds are rushing to the shock, the fight is thickening, and we are warriors. Shame upon the craven who stays from the battle. The trump is sounding today. Mohammed has waked from his sleep. The Moslem with his bloody hands has sought to slay our race. The Hindu, too, the meek-eyed Hindu. His eyes have glared like the eyes of his tiger, and his lips have smacked with gore. The battle is raging, not there alone. Popery hath aroused itself. With mighty effort it is endeavoring to win back this gem of the sea, this first isle of the ocean. Infidelity, too, is on the stir. Her myrmidians are flying here and there. Everything is awake, except the church of God. O oh, rouse ye, men and brethren, rouse now that the fight is at its fullest fury. Now is the time for our most desperate valor, our most earnest zeal. Recollect every time you bow your knees and say, Our Father. You tell a lie at the end of that prayer if you are not seeking to make his kingdom come and his will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You are praying for what you do not try to get. You are insulting God by saying, Thy kingdom come, with as foul a mockery as if I should say, Be warmed and filled to some poor dying beggar, and then refuse to give him his needs, that he might remove his distresses. Recollect, too, that you cannot be Christians at all, not in the right sense of the word, unless you, every one of you, would compass sea and land to make one proselyte. You must have in you the spirit of propagation, desirous to win others to Christ, or else the genuine blood of Christianity is not in your veins. Of all things in the world, Christianity is the most prolific, if it be true. Mohammedanism of old had mighty power to spread itself, but not such power as Christianity had. The religion of Jesus began like a mustard seed, with those few men in an upper room. But ere half a century had rolled away, the gospel was preached to every nation under heaven. And if we had Christianity in our hearts of the right sort, hot, burning stuff, not the lukewarm shams of this degenerate age, our religion, ere another half a century, will have won the day. If the Spirit of God should give us true diligence, in the course of another half-century there would not be one district that would not have been trodden by the foot of the minister, nor one town or city which would not have been evangelized. I know I am not speaking without book now. I am absolutely certain that what I am saying is a sober matter of fact. If you will just calculate the proportion between the four hundred and the progress made in one half a century, and then begin with the three or four millions, I should hope there are as many as that, of true Christians in the world, I say it is a little thing to believe that if they were true to their profession, they might, under divine blessing, carry the gospel into every known part of the habitable world before half a century has rolled away. However, we need not be afraid we shall do that. There is no fear that we shall run into any fanaticism, this is the last sin this age will commit. We shall go on and be as orthodox and cold as we always were. No enthusiasm will ever fall upon us. We shall not see any very great and strange developments of an enormous fanaticism at the present day. Do not be alarmed, brothers and sisters. All I preach that looks like fanaticism will not hurt this age. You may do what you will. Preach you never so wisely. Ye will never make this deaf adder here. The church of this day is a great deal too deaf to do anything extravagant. 
we do a little, and think it a wonderful deal. We each give fourpence to send testaments to China. We will talk of it for the next fifty years. We have sent out one or two missionaries to India, and are they not one or two compared with their needs? It is a great thing. It is a fine thing for the whole Baptist denomination to raise twenty thousand pounds a year, when there are some men in the denomination who make as much money as that in the time. It is a marvelous thing that out of the whole lot of us we should not be able to get more than that. But you know I am an imprudent man, of course. I shall always be, I dare say, to dare to hint that some people have a great deal too much money to go to heaven with. Of course, it will be very wicked if I dare to say this morning that to die rich is a very frightful thing, that there are some people who have got too much riches to allow us to have any sure and certain hope that they have the love of God at all. For if they had more of the love of God, they would not grip their money so tightly. They would say, While men are damning, what is my money? While men are dying, what is my gold? There it goes. As much as I need, I have. God allows it me. As much as I shall require in my old age, as much as my family can demand of me, that will I have. But as for more, a blast and a curse would be on it if I had it. My gold and my silver would be cankered, for I should be guilty of the blood of men's souls, and then condemnation would be at my door, because I had the money wherewithal to send the minister to preach to them, and I would not give it. Now I say again, there is no fear of anyone becoming improvidently liberal. You need not be frightened that anyone here will give a thousand pounds this morning. We provide ample accommodation for those who feel inclined to do so. If anyone should be overtaken with such an enormous fit of generosity, we will register and remember it. But I fear there are no people like Barnabas now. Barnabas brought all he had and put it into the treasury. Dear friend, do not do that. Do not be so rash. Ah, uh, he will not do that. There is no necessity for you to advise him. But I do say again, if Christianity were truly in our hearts, if we were what we profess to be, the men of generosity whom we meet with now and hold up as very paragons and patterns would cease to be wonders, for they would be as plentiful as leaves upon the trees." We demand of no man that he should beggar himself, but we do demand of every man who makes a profession that he is a Christian that he should give his fair proportion, and not be content with giving as much to the cause of God as his own servant. We must have it that the man who is rich must give richly. We know the widow's might is precious, but the widow's might has been an enormously great loss to us. Oh, that widow's might has lost Jesus Christ many a thousand pounds. It is a very good thing in itself. But people with thousands a year talk of giving a widow's might. What a wicked application of what never can apply to them. No, in our proportion we must serve our God. Now I come in conclusion to ask you very pointedly and plainly, what you mean to do in answer to the heathen's cry, Come over and help us. Have I in all this congregation one man who loves sound doctrine, who has ability to preach, and who has a mind to go and preach the gospel in other lands? Because if I have, and if I have ten others who have a mind to give him ten pounds a year, I have an opening for sending him out at once. In Port Natal there are twenty Baptists, and those twenty Baptists are desirous of having a minister who should not only preach to them but to the wild tribes around. They will raise him one hundred pounds if we can manage to get the rest and send out a missionary. Who can tell? He might be another Livingston, perhaps a Moffat. Oh, that I had the honor of sending such an one from such a congregation as this! Have we no young men here this morning who are ready to volunteer to go and preach the gospel in heathen lands? I confess, when I think of myself, I know I cannot go away. My calling is here. And yet I sometimes think what a lazy, featherbed life it is for one to lead, to be preaching here, when there are all these continents without the gospel. 
Some people think it is wonderfully hard to preach two or three sermons a week. But I think preaching thirteen or fourteen is a fearfully little thing. And I think sometimes, oh, if I were somewhere else, where there are some toils, some hardships to undergo, there is nothing to be done here. We cannot suffer, we cannot work, we cannot win crowns of martyrdom, we cannot win great battles here as we could wish. Yes, young man, I say again, if you are ambitious, if you are ambitious to serve Christ, the height of your ambition should lead you to say, I desire to preach the gospel among the heathen. I hope there may be some here, some one at least, whose heart God hath touched. What? Can it be possible that I should this morning address some eight thousand people, and yet out of the whole eight thousand there is not one who can say, Here am I, send me? Is it not strange? Very probably there is not. But yet I would fain hope that somewhere there is one who will write on the tablet of his heart, I will go home to pray, I will go home to study, and if God has given me power to preach, if there be any door open in his providence, here am I. I will be a preacher of the gospel in foreign lands. And now, what are you resolved to do who cannot preach? Why, there are some of you, if you were to get up and preach, you had a great deal better sit down. It would not do for you to go and preach in foreign lands, because nobody would listen to you. I have often marveled that some people who should think themselves called to preach when they have no ability. As I tell them, if God calls anybody to fly, he will give them wings, and if he calls them to preach, he will give them ability to preach. But if a man has not the ability to preach, I am sure he has not the call. Well, what will you do? Says one, I will pray earnestly in support of missions. I will cry to God that great results may follow. Do so, and you shall have our best thanks for your prayers. But in doing that, you have not done very much. For recollect, that is what the Roman priest did for the beggar. The priest said he would not give him a sovereign, he would not give him a half-crown, nor would he give him a penny. Holy Father, said the beggar, will you give me your prayers? Yes, said the priest, kneel down. No, not so, said the beggar, for if your prayers had been worth a penny, you would not have given them me. And when you say you will pray, but will not help the cause with something more substantial, though we love your prayers, we might say, you would not give them if they were worth a penny. If you have naught else to give to Christ, ye need not be ashamed of saying, Jesus, I give thee my prayers. But if you are blessed in your substance, you will be lying before him if you ask him to bless his cause and do not give of your means in its support. Now, let each, as he is able, help this great cause. And above all, let us all in our spheres be preachers of the gospel, seeking to tell to others round what a dear Savior we have found. Let me say, before the collection is made, just this word. Alas, there are some of you here that are as much heathen as if you were in Africa. To you I proclaim the gospel, and I have done. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. This message, The Cry of the Heathen, was preached by Charles Haddon Spurgeon on April 25, 1858.